people will be talking about global brain and mind health. Can I ask you, um, Zul, to start us off by discussing the intersection of neuroscience research with mental health advancements in low and middle income countries and what you think the role of BMI should be um, on that agenda? This neuroscience that we talk about is actually the study of the brain and how it works and its impact on the psychological well-being is really very intricately connected. So we, as I said, we are getting exposed more and more to stressors from our environment. And uh, we are at a point where um, those escape mechanisms, like early on in our evolution, our systems that were developed were originally developed to deal with acute stressors. And then the stressors were gone. Now it's not the same. We're getting stressors every day. And so it is having a, taking a toll in our body on our bodies and the functioning of the brain, not only just the functioning, but actually architecturally it is changing your brain and how you deal with the environmental stressors. So our motto at the Brain and Mind Institute is from the neuron to the neighborhood for that reason, is that there is not a gap. It is part of a continuum and we need to treat it as such if you're going to understand long term how to deal with these stressful situations. I'll summarize a few key, uh, you know, scientific discoveries, which I think they are discoveries actually, uh, which are also changing the face of how we think about uh, interventions for mental health. When we talk about psychosocial interventions, you know, the, the, the old standard was 30 sessions uh, delivered in a hospital by somebody who's 15 years of training. Today, almost all the global mental health innovations involve very brief interventions. The second important innovation has been, of course, the deployment of uh, anyone in the community who is available to deliver care. It turns out that people with no education at all, such as the community health workers of India, can be effectively trained to deliver these brief interventions with enormous effect. And the third, of course, is that, uh, that you can't see these innovations in isolation from the rest of the health system. So you've really got to see this as a continuum of care. One size does not fit all. And so the ideal system of care is what we should be focusing on, a system where people receive the care that they need and at the time that they need it. When we looked at the communities we work in, like for instance in the urban informal settlements, Really, there is a lot of violence and exposure to violence to pregnant women. You know, children experience a lot of trauma early in life. And when we thought of an intervention for fathers within an urban informal settlement, they were like, we don't have time for sessions and all that. But we know there is a really good mobile penetration right now. So we, we took a, a really good intervention from Australia, culturally adapted it, and sent out SMS very early on, from the second trimester. And you know, fathers were actually surprised that when you stress the mother, the stress has long-term impacts for the newborn and for the child. And this was really su successfully implemented. As the Dean, um, Lukoya, can you please give us some of your thoughts around uh, the role of educational institutions in promoting brain health and mental health awareness? We do training, we both for people who are coming in for initial training but also for continuing professional development uh, in the areas of mental and brain health. The second thing we do is the research to figure out whether the things Amina, Vikram, Zul, everybody's doing, whether those things are really helpful and how to make them more helpful. The other thing we do is trying out things and when they're not successful we still learn from them and when they're successful then we think about ways of scaling this up and getting it implemented. 